Welcome to the President's State of the Institute Address. I'm Prabhat Jela, Provost at Rensselaer, and it is my pleasure to introduce the 18th President of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the Honorable Shirley Ann Jackson. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Now, I hope that all of you here for reunion and homecoming are, in fact, enjoying this weekend. I hope you have noticed the wonderful weather we finally brought for you. <laughs> we hope that you are finding and reconnecting with old friends and, of course, with the Institute, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And I do want to offer special congratulations to the great class of 1968. celebrating your 50th reunion. And if any members of the class are in the audience, please stand for a moment and let us see who you are. Now, I would urge that all of our alumni and alumnae, while you're here, to strike up a conversation with a current student. Uh, because although I'm about to offer you a brief State of the Institute, that, that will summarize the ways that we're making a remarkable student experience even more remarkable and moving forward as a university. Our students are really the ones and our faculty who will be able to tell you firsthand what an exciting place Rensselaer is to live and learn in this early part of the uh, 21st century. Now, what you're looking at is a sentient robot, but more later. Now, I don't have to tell you, you know Rensselaer was founded in 1824 by Stephen Van Rensselaer and Amos Eaton, both of whom had an unusually keen sense of the context in which they lived, the context, and of the demands of a resource-rich young country embarking on its first industrial revolution. They understood that to become a, an industrial power, the nation would require the infrastructure for trade and transport so that each in his own realm worked to make the Erie Canal a reality. They understood as well that the world needed young people ready to apply science to the common purposes of life. And so they founded the Rensselaer School as a radical alternative to institutions offering a classical or religious education. The education offered here was not about looking towards the past, but understanding the present state of knowledge in order to shape the future. And here, almost 200 years later, we remain keenly aware of the context within which we are educating our young people. Now, last January, I had the great privilege, once again, of representing Rensselaer at the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland. And for two years, I was co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on International Security, and I was asked to lead a session at Davos entitled The Geopolitics of 2030. And with this session, I was given the fascinating challenge with some others of considering the major factors likely to shape the uh, global landscape a dozen years from now, the geopolitical. Now, since all of us here at Rensselaer are focused on changing the world, I thought I would give you a brief synopsis of, of what I said about the vulnerabilities, consequences, and opportunities that provide a context for all of our best efforts at Rensselaer in the next dozen years. Now, of course, the era following the Cold War, in which the United States led the international order, order and it was a time when I grew up, as did you, um, we now are beginning to see broad economic shifts with, of course, China and Russia exerting greater regional influence. And by 2030, the expectation is a new degree of, of economic strength in emerging economies, including Nigeria, Iran, Egypt, Indonesia, Mexico, and Turkey. And the speed at which they are emerging is unprecedented because globally over 2 billion more people are expected to enter the middle class by 2030. But GDP and, uh, is not the only determinant of the context within which our students today 
will build their lives and careers. The other factors are first, uh, of course, access to and control of key strategic resources, especially energy related ones. Secondly, the ability to adapt to changing weather patterns, to climate change. And third, human capital and changing demographics. And fourth, the influence of rapidly advancing technologies. And that's where we sit. Now, we're likely to be moving to a lower carbon world with a changing energy mix that will shift uh, even international alliances and, and will alter the definition of strategic resources. We know that countries rich in oil and natural gas have had a great political, a geopolitical advantage because of the, of the abundance of those resources. And fossil fuels are not going away. They will still be important in 2030. However, renewable energy uh, is being produced more locally and is bringing electricity, for instance, to rural populations in the developing world that never before had it. And that electrification is allowing them then to connect into uh, the technologies of the so-called fourth industrial revolution. Now, there will always be critical strategic resources, but the mix may be different. For example, as the transportation sector electrifies increasingly, uh, materials essential to lithium ion batteries will be key. They seem to dominate across many sectors. And I don't know if you think about it, but the production and mining of uh, those re kinds of resources like lithium, and, and it also includes cobalt and graphite, is actually the, the holding of that is, is limited. It's dominated by a few nations. And as much as 54% of the world's lithium comes from the so-called lithium triangle of Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. 55% of cobalt is mined in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And 66% of the world's graphite is produced in China. And so that means that people are increasingly looking for ways not only to have access to those resources, but to find substitutes. And, and the search for new materials is therefore an increasingly important and extremely interesting challenge for us. And that includes our own uh, Center for Materials, Devices, and Integrated Systems here at Rensselaer and its associated students and faculty where people are looking at the design of, of new materials and using materials that we have in different ways. A second factor are changing uh, climate effects, which uh, already uh, can, is causing droughts in Africa and threatening rain-fed agriculture there. But that's happening at the same time as there are sea level rises and storm surges that threaten low elevation coastal cities around the globe. And as Hurricane Florence has shown, coastal regions in the US are not immune to this threat. But there are nonetheless, interestingly, new natural resource opportunities opened up by these changes in climate because the shrinking ice cover in the Arctic Circle is allowing new resources and even trade routes to be exploited, including an estimated 30% of conventional uh, natural gas reserves, undiscovered ones, and 13% of undiscovered conventional oil reserves. And so uh, this is an interesting time. The third factor is, in fact, uh, diverging uh, demographics between the aging developed world and the developing world. And in certain uh, projections in 2030, those divides will be more extreme with much of Africa, for instance, having a median population age under 20, while countries in Europe and China, Russia, and Japan will be more than uh, twice that, more like 45. And so uh, aging developed economies may struggle, actually, to maintain GDP growth with a scarcity of people of working age. But people are looking to advances in artificial intelligence and robotics to increase productivity and to keep developed countries from stagnating. At the same time, artificial intelligence and machine learning may speed up the disappearance of, of middle-skilled jobs 
and potentially increase income inequality. And that's something that is under uh, heavy discussion here as well. But the fourth factor, which plays to where we are uh, shaping the geopolitics uh, of 2030, is rooted in technologies of what has been called the fourth industrial revolution. In other words, technologies that are merging the digital realm with the physical and the biological uh, realms. Now, of course, the shifts due to this uh, merging or interconnectivity can be exacerbated by the fact that many of the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, people worry can be weaponized, such as using commercial drones for uh, dropping bombs or other things, 3D printing, which in fact has produced uh, grenade launchers, uh, CRISPR gene editing, which people feel may create uh, uh, pathological with pathogens that are more virulent, and cyber physical systems that can offer new angles of attack. But here in the university, we are about hope and opportunity because these same technologies offer so much hope for strengthening what we do in commerce, in human health and welfare, and in energy and industrial processes. As well, advances in artificial intelligence, immersive technologies and computer vision and, and others allow for a new approach to teaching, learning, and research. And so technologies create opportunities, and that's where we are. And we think that a, a new kind of intergenerational compact is important in that regard. And so the, could, if the world could come to resemble Rensselaer more closely, where we in fact work together across the generations, but also across cultures, genders, religions, ethnicities, then we might be better off. But you know, there are challenges to our, the United States scientific and technological leadership. Uh, people have noted that China publishes more articles in peer-reviewed scientific and engineering journals than the United States and uh, may likely pass the United States this year in its investment in research and development. Now, they, China has a 13th five-year plan that has priorities articulated in quantum communications and computing, in brain research, cybersecurity, robotics, gene science, and big data. Well, the United States remains a very innovative and risk-taking uh, culture and country. And interestingly enough, these areas are all strategic thrusts uh, for us, both nationally, but also in research and education here at Rensselaer. And, you know, other countries, obviously, and China among them, are focused on investment in human capital. But here at Rensselaer, we are in the business of human capital development. And so let me tell you about some of that human capital. Most of uh, the freshmen we welcome this fall to Rensselaer, in fact, will be 30 years old in 2030. In other words, they are really beginning to fully grasp uh, their powers and their uh, role in the future. And it will belong to them to address the vulnerabilities, consequences, and opportunities that I've described. Fortunately, demand for Rensselaer education never has been higher. Uh, we had over 20,400 applications for a place in this year's freshman class, that number back in 2000 was about 5,000. And so that application number was a record and higher than the prior year's record. But we are able then to select an extremely strong and diverse group of students. And while this doesn't tell the whole story, the class of 2022 had an average SAT score of around 1410 with the middle 50% range being 1330 to 1500. Importantly, it includes more women and underrepresented minorities than any class in our history. It includes 95 high school valedictorians and salutatorians. But equally importantly, our newest students include celebrated musicians, athletic champions, outstanding community volunteers, an author of two books inventors, entrepreneurs, 
and at least one volunteer farm. So how do we prepare these talented young people for the careers they will uh, have and for a world that may unfold as I've described? Well, first, within the vision of the new Polytechnic, we work hard to foster three essential qualities of our, in our students, the intellectual agility to, to be rooted in a discipline, but to see across disciplines and to create entirely new tools and technologies and make new discoveries that will change the world. Second, the multicultural sophistication that does allow them to reach across generations, geographies, sectors, uh, disciplines, uh, backgrounds to address great challenges. And finally, a global view that recognizes the, the, the degree to which the most important risks and opportunities are broadly shared by all of humanity. And I'm happy to say that our superb academic programs prepare Rensselaer students to lead and are recognized as such by various entities. And as you know, there's been an explosion of entities that uh, look at and, and evaluate uh, universities with a finer and finer lens and focus in uh, certain areas. For example, Forbes recently ranked Rensselaer 14th on its list of the nation's best STEM colleges and universities. Now we know we're really the best. Now, <laughs> our information technology and web sciences program has been ranked first in the nation by college choice, and it links directly to what you're gonna hear uh, in our global game changers panel this morning. And it ranks first among undergraduate programs at national colleges and universities. Our Masters of Business Analytics has been ranked third by TFE Times, our undergraduate physics program, sixth by College Factual. Our School of Architecture, small and mighty, is ranked 13th by Design Intelligence. Our games and simulation arts and sciences program, depending on the ranker, is ranked anywhere from 12th in the country to 6th. So we're highly attuned to the opportunities, and especially to the opportunities created by emerging disciplines. And we're expanding our academic offerings, even as we strengthen our traditional ones in new ways. Over the course of the Rensselaer Plan and the Rensselaer Plan 2024 to this point, we have created 21 new academic programs. And that includes a new Bachelor of Science in Music that is a program that is designed to prepare students for 21st century music careers in realms such as composition for gaming or digital music networks. Those of you who may have had the chance to go to the ribbon cutting of our new me uh, media suite in uh, the Darren Communications Center got a, a bit of a taste of what we're about. Uh, we have a new focus in our economics department on quantitative health economics. We're developing a new Bachelor of Science program in the Lally School of Management in quantitative finance and analytics, and a new academic program in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And while we educate our students for deep knowledge in their own chosen fields, we also ensure that they develop those skills that cut across disciplines. And that is why Rensselaer is the first university in the nation to include a data dexterity requirement in its core curriculum. Because we believe that no matter what field of endeavor they choose, our graduates will need ever more strongly to use diverse data sets to define and address complex challenges. So all students at Rensselaer must complete two data intensive courses, one to establish the foundations of data modeling and analysis, and a second course that applies modern data analytics within their academic disciplines. We also offer our students significant opportunities to test what they learn out in the world and through approaches such as our newest one, the ARCH, which we have been piloting for the past two summers and which will be fully implemented this next summer, the summer of 2019. Under the arch, all rising Rensselaer juniors will remain on the campus the summer after their sophomore years, taking junior level classes and benefiting from the undivided attention of their professors 
and our student life staff. This allows them to spend a semester or more away from campus during the traditional junior year and importantly still graduate on time. And it allows them to spend a more extended uh, period because our actual typical fall and spring semesters are longer and they always have a break uh, or a summer after that. And with the help of our Center for Career and Professional Development, they will choose an away semester experience that suits their interests, needs, and passions, whether an internship or launching a business or a volunteer or research experience or an approved individual learning experience. And we will encourage as many of our students as can to go abroad in order to gain insights relevant to the broader world. We continue to invest in our clustered learning advocacy and support for students or class as our model of student life designed to provide one of the best student experiences in the United States. Now, one area of concern for us and for many other universities has been Greek life. Now, nationally, dozens of colleges and universities have suspended or eliminated Greek life because of incidents related to alcohol abuse, illegal drug use, hazing, sexual misconduct, sexual assault, and acts of racial or religious discrimination and bigotry. Now, I have to say that Rensselaer has not been immune to these problems. And just recently, within our own Greek system, we have experienced drug-related incidents, alcohol abuse, sexual misconduct, and instances of hazing. Now, I'm not implying that these are just ubiquitous, but these are not just isolated incidents. And unfortunately, we have documented that they have been increasing in number. And in addition, a number of our Greek houses are not in the best physical and safety condition. And we currently have five of our fraternities on suspension. But here's the thing, and this is an important thing. At the same time, we recognize that Greek life is an important part of many students' experience of Rensselaer. When our Greek system supports academic achievement, community service, and leadership development, it fosters young men and women of great strength and character who go on and go out to change the world. And we have four of our fraternities that are exemplary. And our Greek system at Rensselaer is 165 years old and has quite a legacy. And when Greek organizations fulfill their intended purposes, they create deep friendships, provide members a support network, and aid in the personal development of our young people. And we know that for many of our students, Greek life is an essential part of their experience here at Rensselaer. And that is why it is important to have an open conversation about how to keep Greek life strong and vital at RPI. And our goal and intent, and you heard this from me, is to preserve the Greek system with a focus on three tenets, sustainability, community, and citizenship. So in order to preserve and strengthen our Greek system, we have appointed, I have appointed, a Greek Life Review Committee to formally assess the current state of Greek life at Rensselaer and to consider the best path forward. The committee comprises student leaders, both Greek and non-Greek, alumni and alumnae, Greek and non-Greek, parents, faculty, administrators, and representatives from the national offices of Greek organizations of which Rensselaer chapters are members. The review committee includes the Greek Life Task Force led by Vice President and Chief Information Officer John Kolb of the class of 1979. And it is charged with assessing the Greek Life system and identifying what is necessary to enact a long-term sustainable and comprehensive culture change so that the Greek system can continue to help our students to thrive on the campus and to find their places in the world. 
Now, we expect the task force to deliver recommendations for the best path forward by Thanksgiving, and we will keep all of you informed of our progress. And finally, at our reunion and homecoming weekend last year, we launched a billion-dollar capital campaign, Transformative Campaign for Global Change. Our goals for the campaign are eliminating the gap between student financial need and the scholarships and fellowships we are able to give while enhancing the student experience, allowing many more pro professorships to attract uh, and retain the best academic talent, and to expand our tenured and tenure track faculty to 500 in critical areas of teaching and research. And finally, upgrading and expanding our campuses technologically and physically. Physically to accommodate our growth, including building a new center for science, expanding the Johnson Engineering Center, and doing the next phase of the East Campus Athletic Village. While continuing to strengthen, upgrade, repurpose, and renovate existing facilities. Now, realizing these goals is essential to prepare Rensselaer for its third century. We began the campaign last fall with 400 million already committed by Rensselaer alumni, alumnae, parents, friends, and partners. But we cannot truly fulfill our mission without the generosity of our philanthropic partners. So please allow me to tell you about one of these partners. In early 2017, the United Health Foundation indicated interest in working with Rensselaer to develop a cadre of talented graduates ready to apply data science to some of humanity's most difficult healthcare challenges. The United Health Foundation is the philanthropic arm of United Health Group, a leading healthcare company that provides benefits and services to 139 million people in 130 countries around the world. With a generous $1.1 million grant from the United Health Foundation, Rensselaer now is expanding opportunities for our students to learn health informatics and to apply their knowledge in health data science research projects, preparing them to reveal new connections and new answers in biomedicine. And I'm going to ask the architects of this partnership to join me on the stage for a, uh, a picture, and then we will have uh, two of them uh, offer some remarks about what the impact of this partnership is, but also why uh, United Health Group decided to do it. So let me invite forward Dr. Paul Bleicher of the Rensselaer class of 1976. Excuse me. And CEO of Optum Labs, part of United Health Group. Ms. Ms. Ann Yao, Vice President of Grants and Programs for the United Health Foundation. And Principal Investigator Professor Kristen Bennett of our Departments of Mathematical Sciences and Computer Science and Associate Director of the Rensselaer Institute for Data Exploration and Applications, or the Rensselaer IDEA. Following that, I would ask Dr. Bleicher to tell us why uh, you've made this investment in our students. And I will ask Professor Bennett to tell us what the grant from the United Health Foundation will mean to uh, education at Rensselaer. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. I'm thrilled to be here today to celebrate the partnership between Rensselaer and the United Health Foundation, and would like to thank Do President Jackson for her remarks and her leadership in continuously reinventing Rensselaer and creating a culture 
where these types of partnerships can flourish. As the CEO of Optum Labs, I've been privileged to have Rensselaer, Rensselaer as one of our 30 partners who are working on collaborative projects to address the most pressing problems in healthcare. RPI is a long-standing and active partner who is working on projects in diabetes, autism, and data privacy. Speaking on behalf of the United Health Foundation for a moment, I can say that the foundation is dedicated to improving health and healthcare. But we know that transforming healthcare can't be done alone. It's through innovative, meaningful partnerships like this that we can make the biggest difference. Investing in health is vital for making the healthcare system work better. We take investment seriously. United Health Group, which is the parent company of Optum Labs, invests $3.3 billion in innovation and technology each year. But investing in technology isn't enough. Investing in a modern health workforce is essential for meeting the healthcare challenges of tomorrow. By cultivating a diverse workforce of data scientists to identify relationships and trends in ever-growing data, we can transform healthcare. This opportunity is exciting, and it, it is why this grant is so important to us as a company. I've been watching this project take shape, driven by the vision of Dr. Kristen Bennett. Under her leadership, new courses and exciting innovative learning opportunities have already been deployed, with students reporting that they are strongly interested in learning more about health informatics and pursuing healthcare careers. We're grateful for this partnership with Dr. Bennett and are excited to partner with Rensselaer in helping to build a stronger and healthier world. I'd now like to ask Dr. Bennett to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I am, have the pleasure of implementing the project with United Health, and it's very exciting. It's part of my role as Associate Director of the Rensselaer Institute for Data Exploration and Application, or IDEA. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with IDEA, our mission is to enable research across the Institute for addressing emerging challenges in our ever-increasing data-driven world. So the tools of data science are especially important in healthcare, but we need to have more people trained in the application of these tools in healthcare to realize the promise of improving the quality of healthcare and reducing its cost. So our grant with United Health Foundation enables us to create a new workforce pipeline that attracts a broader pool of students into data science and prepares them for careers in health informatics. This ground has allowed us to create new curricula to introduce students from majors such as biology and mathematics to informatics and to expose students to real-world health analytic challenges. In addition, it provides students the opportunities to participate in data-driven research on open healthcare problems. I'd like to thank the foundation for this awesome opportunity that, that we bring to our students. And I'd like to thank Paul Bleicher for coming today. So we really value these partnerships and partnerships like this will enable us to yield tomorrow's transformative healthcare discoveries and innovations. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Kristen. So let me tell you the last good news here. On October 24th of this year, we will hold a scholarship gala 
in New York City. This is our second such. And at that, we will announce a number of new transformative gifts that will bring us closer to our goal of $500 million by the end of the, our fiscal year. The gala will be followed by a performance by the Rensselaer Orchestra at Carnegie Hall in celebration of our new Bachelor of Science degree in music. It, would be, it should be a very exciting uh, evening. Uh, uh, Greg Easton says the uh, tickets are going fast. And so I hope that all of you will uh, come and join us. And we're going to move into the second part of our uh, program, but I know I've already given you a, a quite a bit to digest, so I thought I would just pause for a minute or two and see if there are any questions that anyone has on anything that you've heard to this point. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> 